much in um, getting this event together today and, and connecting me to with such important uh, panelists. I'd also like to respectfully acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional and unceded territory of the Quaquitlam First Nation and that they have been the stewards of the Quiquitlam watershed for generations, time and memorial. So um, uh, there's lots of um, uh, lots of stewardship that's happened around the watersheds uh, here in Coquitlam. I wanted to share with everyone that the seed of this event was an email from Otto Langer at the back end of last year, uh, just reiterating to me the perils of this offset mindset of, of being able to offset um, our loss of species and species of risk and how it's really the responsibility of all humans, but certainly of um, those in government to protect the ecosystems in the Fraser River estuary and that the time is now to do it. And um, as I said, I got in touch with some of the people that I know in this space and it just widened out and there's so many conversations about this happening in the, in the uh, area. And it, this today is just an opportunity to hear from a few. So um, today I'm doing my best to spread the message about bringing together the experts in the field of ecological stewardship and governance. And I'm honored to uh, present, or to introduce to, to you today, Director Jordan Point, Dr. Tara Martin and Dr. Ken Ashley to, to share with us. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pass to Alex to just go through some of the very quick um, logistics and then I will uh, introduce our first speaker. Alex. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming today. Um, my name is Alex Lidstone. I'm calling in from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakoda, the Sutsina, First Nations, and all others who make their home in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I am the network coordinator at Climate Caucus. So we're sort of running this event today. Um, just a couple of quick things to mention. Um, we're keeping things pretty simple. So if you have a question, please just use the Q&A function and um, we'll have that enabled for the entire duration of the conversation. And we'll be answering questions at the end of all three speakers. So just feel free to ask questions along as they go. And um, we will also be recording the session to share for later. Um, so yeah, with that, we can dive right in and I'll pass it back on to Benita. Thank you very much. And I'll start with introducing Director, Executive Director Jordan Point of the uh, First Nation Fishery Council. And after a 20 year career with the federal government, uh, concluding in many senior management roles, Jordan became the Executive Director of the First Nation Fisheries Council of British Columbia in 2010. Concurrently, he also serves as a member of council with the Musqueam First Nation. He is a clear thinker with extensive capacity and understanding of management, government process, business implementation, and First Nations governance. He has a strong board of director experience in both the public and private sectors, as well as First Nation LLP structures. He was valedictorian and top recruit at the Justice Institute of BC Police Academy and was certified by the RCMP Coordinated Law Enforcement Training Unit in instructional techniques and facilitation, as well as the Harvard Public Dispute Program in interest-based negotiations and public dispute resolution. Welcome, Jordan Point. Thank you, Benita. Ejual Stiem, Isiaya, Ike Tanisqualoan, Wananu Ike Tanisqualoan, Ikwans Quetzinala. What I'm saying to you, uh, you people, is that I bring good thoughts in my mind and good feelings in my heart for the work that we're doing here today. Speaking to you in uh, my uh, home language of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. And I'm uh, very, very uh, appreciative of being able to be here and speak on these issues today. So I um, just wanted to uh, greet you in a good way and get the meeting started in a good way, as is our, our practice and our teachings. Um, I just wanted to kind of give some context about the conversation uh, from the First Nations Fisheries Council perspective. Uh, we um, work on behalf of um, uh, the First Nations Leadership Council that mandated the creation of the Fisheries Council. And our role and our function and purpose is to help to advance uh, the interests and aspirations of BC First Nations in relation to fisheries, fish habitat, and water issues. And um, 
We seek to uh, always support mechanisms of good governance uh, at whatever scale in the province that First Nations are involved in and help to position First Nations in that conversation. So that brings us to this, this table today and, and, and involves us in that conversation. So we're gonna speak to you a little bit about uh, this process. And uh, just for um, an editorial side note, I'm going to presume that not everybody is, uh, is an expert in uh, indigenous relations and, and case law. So some of it may be um, pretty novice uh, information for some of you, and some of you may be learning this for the first time. So that's the context uh, of this presentation today. Uh, first slide is really just understanding the First Nations as partners in management of the Fraser River estuary. We uh, see that, um, especially in, in the recent uh, past year and a half, given some um, matters of crisis, the, the big bar issue, the um, stocks of decline, uh, everybody is getting uh, very concerned about the plight of uh, Pacific salmon and the habitats and, uh, and ecosystems that uh, they reside in. So it seems to be everybody wants a strategy and every table I go to, people are looking for a strategy. So this conversation is percolating on other fronts also. I just wanted to put some context to that. So I'm going to ask Alex to move to the next slide, please. Um, so so from, as I indicated that, uh, you know, some of you may be aware and some aren't, uh, I often uh, work with other groups and people are always asking the why. Why are we doing this? And why do First Nations have, uh, have this special kind of uh, status and relationship? So it goes back into um, the reconciliation conversation. You know, uh, the federal government has indicated that um, they've accepted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And um, the province itself has also accepted um, new legislation on the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People Act, which is to review all laws and uh, legislation that may be in conflict uh, with First Nations relationship currently. So what we're doing is, is looking at what does that mean? What does reconciliation mean? And it's, and it's really uh, trying to align one, one worldview with another and try to find some place to find uh, um, some middle ground to work together and collaborate on that. So we know that since time immemorial, First Nations have been on these lands. And uh, those of you that are, have been here in British Columbia know that uh, um, the nations have been here um, stewarding the land and resources for many, many uh, millennia and um, looking after their, their, um, their resources in, in the um, altruistic version of like, this is for future generations. Everything that we do is really a worldview of seven generations. We wanna be looking forward seven generations. We wanna be thinking back and reflecting on the, the people that came before us seven generations ago. And when you think about a generation that's about 140 years that we have to consider in the uh, indigenous worldview, that you're looking ahead that far for future generations and you're considering the people that looked out for your best interest. So you have to be mindful and respectful of that. And realistically, what we're trying to do is, is taking that responsibility in exercising the constitutionally affirmed Aboriginal rights that are in the constitution. And that kind of uh, worldview continues in this day. And what we're, we're really looking at is unfinished business in, in, in the um, um, worldview of, of Canada in terms of like um, British common law principles. So some of you may be aware, historically there were articles of fiduciary obligation set out a, a legal framework right going back to the 1763 Royal Proclamation in which uh, you know, the king acknowledged that, hey, we're going to a different, uh, different land. And when you go into that land, uh, you need to kind of treat those people as wards of the crown, treat them right, treat them as though you are there on behalf of the, of the crown. And that's how we kind of like initiated that original treaty process. You know, there were, there were like recognitions that, you know, the crown um, had an obligation to deal in a good way with the, the inhabitants of the land. So this kind of set out kind of like the legal responsibility that exists today. 
And uh, we have, uh, you know, since Confederation and then on to the Constitution Act, governments and First Nations have, have been advised by the courts that, hey, taking legal action and all that, it burns up everybody's money, burns up everybody's time. It's probably better for us to just try and work on solutions proactively, as opposed to always going to the courts and litigating. So, um, as we indicated, the province recognizing, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the commitment of Canada uh, developed the DRIPA Act, and uh, it was establishing the statutory basis for implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And that act and other efforts related to reconciliation offered opportunities for First Nations to assert governance and management priorities and be positioned as shared decision makers with government, industry, and other stakeholders. Next slide, please. So you know we've been working, I indicated before that uh, we've been working at other tables with other organizations, both federal, provincial, non-government organizations, private corporations, uh, as the Fisheries Council, recognizing that they're all trying to find a way forward. And we always refer to it in our language as getting to a good place in a good way. And so the current environment that we're in uh, has brought us to this conversation that realistically, due to the close proximity to urban centers and industrial hubs, the shipping route, the, uh, all of the activities that are going on in our, our local geography, the Fraser River estuary and the surrounding ecosystem will continue to be impacted by population growth, urbanization, industrialization into the foreseeable future. And there's a need for a central process in identifying industrial impacts in a way to offset those impacts to the environment, such as you know, renewed implementation of the Fraser River Estuary Management Plan um, in the long-term management protection of the Fraser River in perpetuity. We all see this as a good objective. The question is not really about, should we do this? It's about how we do this. And I think everybody is looking at um, doing the right thing. And so the real question that we've been having at a number of tables is how do we leverage uh, the capacity that exists and build uh, collaborative processes? You know, the historical use and occupancy of First Nations indicates that they should be involved in a meaningful and leadership role at the table and in the management of aquatic ecosystems and habitat through that process as it sustained many nations for thousands of years. It's not only legally appropriate, it's morally proper. And those nations should be involved in that conversation as, as the, the you know, original inhabitants. And uh, you know, the Calder decision indicated to us that when the settlers arrived, there were already organized societies here. So this is the right thing for us to be thinking about. And this is the kind of common language that we use at many tables. Next slide, please, Alex. So, the key considerations for us to be thinking about in this conversation is, should we develop a, a centralized process to address all of the long-term health and sustainability issues in the Fraser? Um, and should we create that structure? There's several key considerations of, uh, of note that we should be uh, thinking about in terms of supporting indigenous participation. The lower Fraser region hosts a complex political environment uh, amongst First Nations. There's over 40 plus First Nations, both locally and adjacent, that have interests and access to Fraser River for fisheries, water, spiritual use, and ongoing historical um, uh, access that they've been using for, for many years. Um, the Crown governments, municipalities, industry, and non-governmental organizations all have differing perspectives. They seek uh, different uses of resources, and they also have different governing structures. So it's always going to be difficult to reach 100% consensus with the diversity of the different political systems and aspirations between the various First Nations and non-Indigenous layers of government. But if we can open up the door to have that conversation, and better understand one another, it's a way for us to continue to advance that uh, collaborative conversation. So we see the development of a governance structure that leverages the operational and technical level. It will help to alleviate political and dynamic, uh, that, that political dynamic that exists. Next slide, please. 
So this concept really should be thinking about and considering some of the already um, robust and organizational capacity that exists with the um, local First Nations. Uh, it should be supported in that local area by First Nations such as the Musqueam, Coquitlam, Tawasin, Tsleil-Waututh, Semiamu, we could go on and on. And we also know that talking about scope and scale, there's many other organizations that exist beyond those ind independent uh, First Nations. There's the Lower Fraser First Nations Fisheries Alliance. That's, uh, you know, the Stalu uh, nations that have worked together and built a structure that uh, has 22 plus First Nations at their table. There's the First Nations Fisheries Legacy Fund that involves the six nations that came together during the um, um, Gateway Initiative when they were working on the um, South Fraser Perimeter Road and the Patello Bridge. They came together and, and developed the le Legacy Fund to do work uh, to offset impacts to uh, Fraser stocks and uh, stocks of concern in their area. And of course, we at the uh, First Nations Fisheries Council, we work at an umbrella scale of the, of the provincial scale, but we, we always work with the notion that good governance in a local area helps to build good process at a regional and provincial scale. So those organizations encourage collaboration across multiple First Nations and have existing participation that spans not only the Lower Fraser, but out into the Salish Sea. Um, so there is strong existing uh, technical and operational capacity. The, the literacy and um, uh, science capacity that exists is growing more and more amongst those First Nations. And we can leverage that uh, to participate and get First Nations to the table in a meaningful way. One of the things that we are really looking to do is develop centers of expertise of First Nations so they don't have to always look at uh, bringing in consultants and contractors, they can develop that own capacity within their, uh, with their own communities and in their um, collaborative structures. So there's no need to recreate the wheel. We don't have to reinvent this. It's just learning how to work more effectively together. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. <clears throat> so uh, those existing structures, I already went over them, but our structure with the Fisheries Council, uh, ours is, uh, we operate in that intersection between the political and policy level and the technical level. And we have like regional um, um, delegates from around the province. And we work to help inform uh, the, the political decision makers with those technical and operational people that work in the field. Uh, and um, this is just an overview of, of the organizations, the Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance. Uh, we spoke to that earlier. It has a governance protocol that 22 of the 30 uh, Fraser First Nations in the Stalo region uh, all work together. Their mission is to promote and support uh, the management of a robust and expanded fishery for First Nations in the Lower Fraser River. And they have very good capacity at the technical and operational process. And the Legacy Fund I, I indicated earlier, there were six nations that were involved in the, uh, um, the Gateway Initiative um, during the Portman uh, Bridge development and the um, Fraser Perimeter Roads. And their objective is to work in collaboration to remediate and enhance the fish habitat in the Lower Fraser and Burrard Inlet. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings us to the conclusion of the, the kind of overview of what, why First Nations could be involved in this uh, from kind of like a historical context to right into uh, um, contemporary times now of how the, the capacity that First Nations have developed and built over uh, the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, and so there's a, a great network of uh, First Nations that are able to be brought into this conversation and uh, inform this, uh, this dialogue. So I wanna thank the, um, uh, the host for inviting us to this conversation, allow us to share this information with you. So I just guess, yeah. And thank you so much for that. And thank you for taking us all the way uh, into the initial history, which is so important as we begin the journey, some of us. Thank you so much for that. Um, in the interest of time, and I don't, I, I know there's going to be so many questions at the end, I'm going to just go ahead um, with Dr. Ashley being next. Uh, Dr. Ashley received his Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science at UBC in the Zoology Department. 
specializing in aquatic ecology and an MA of Science and a PhD at UBC in the Faculty of Applied Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering. He worked for the Ministry of Environment in the Fisheries Research and Development section on the UBC campus from 1979 to 2005 and the Greater Vancouver Regional District from 2005 to 2007 as a senior engineer and was the project lead for the environmental management team. Dr. Ashley joined BCIT in 2010 and is currently director of the BCIT Rivers Institute and instructor in BCIT's ecological restoration program and an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Environment at SFU. The floor is yours, Dr. Ashley. Thank, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm speaking to you from North Vancouver, so I'm on traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. I'll flip over and hopefully can share this. All right, in the interest of time, we'll get going here because uh, I've got a few slides to work through. And again, thanks very much for the opportunity. And so I was given uh, sort of a distinct list of topics here. And it was, uh, what was the history of the Fraser River Estuary Management Plan? What was the purpose? Why it disappeared and why it's needed? And I added a little bit at the front end just to explain what an estuary is so that we're all on the same page and then I'll have a, a very short conclusion. So first of all, what's an estuary? I teach a course on this at BCIT, uh, undergraduate and graduate course. And uh, you know, the simple thing is that it's uh, semi-enclosed body water where fresh water and salt water mix and mingle. That's where the magic starts. That's a picture of the Fraser Estuary there. And basically you've got uh, the fresh water and the mixing zone between them where salt water comes in at the bottom, fresh water flowing out the top, and then you have salt water on the outer portion. Often the salt water sneaks in on the bottom. We call that a salt wedge, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. So it's an area where you get fresh water off the land mixing with, with uh, ocean water, and you get this brackish water zone in the middle. What that does, it, that constant mixing of fresh water and salt water and the tides coming uh, in and out gives uh, an amazing, creates amazing biomass uh, and high productivity. And so you get a lot of plant, plant life and that builds up into higher trophic levels where you see incredible number of birds that we see on the Fraser, uh, Fraser estuary. Uh, the plants are the base of the food web in the estuary because those plants uh, break down and turn into detritus and that's detritus feeds the the very rich invertebrate food web and that's what feeds the birds and the salmon and, and everything else and so the estuaries really run on detrital carbon it's an interesting food web rather than fresh green carbon estuaries run on the decaying carbon that comes out of all that plant material and what that does, if you look at it, and this is a series of different ecosystems that you can look at that if and on the column over here, this is tons per hectare per year, that estuaries are the most productive ecosystems on the planet. And this, this includes mangrove swamps. So they're way up at the top, even higher than a cornfield out in the Fraser Valley. And that, that just shows you how productive this zone is where you get the mixing between the fresh water and the salt water. And what that's done is it's, uh, you know, since time immemorial for First Nations, it's created uh, uh, a, a real uh, resource that's been used for forever and uh, the expression that you wherever you go on the coast here whether it's the Lummi over in, on uh, the Olympic Peninsula up to north of the Tinglet and uh, Tsewatooth it's when the tide went out the table was set and that was reflective of the astounding productivity in estuaries. Uh, all seen this picture as anybody's gone from from the ferry during Freshette from Tawasson over to Victoria, you see the, the brown water, the Fraser floating on top of the, of, the, of the salt water. And so the fresh water is lighter than the salt water and it floats on top. And what that results in is that in the, the, the full definition of the Fraser estuary is that this salt wedge effect of the salt water, it can come all the way up to the Portman Bridge. And so I've been out sampling in the middle of the night in February there and you can detect salt water on an incoming tide as far up as the Portman Bridge. Tidally, the, the effect goes up to the Pitt River and all the way up to Mission is where the tidal effect can be seen from, from the Fraser Estuary. That freshwater lens during Freshette on a high snowpack year like we're gonna have this year is so big that the sediment plume extends all the way over to Vancouver Island. And this is how fish got colonized Vancouver Island as they swam freshwater fish, they would swim over on that surface lens of water and they can make it all to Vancouver Island. That's a thing that always puzzled me as a kid, how rainbow trout got to Vancouver Island. Well, they could swim across on that layer. And so all of the Salish Sea by times during Freshette has a brackish water layer on it. And that then dissipates as it goes through Harrow Straits and then out into, out into Juan de Fuca. 
the Fraser jurisdiction. This is the, the map here of the old uh, Fremp map, and it sort of showed where the jurisdictional area is where Fremp was. It was the wetted side of the dike. There's around 540 kilometers of shoreline. And at the time that Fremp was uh, was functioning, it was, it was, and I'll talk about this, it was this uh, jurisdiction shared between provincial and federal governments, First Nation minimally, uh, Metro Vancouver and Port Metro Vancouver. So the history of Fremp, where did it come from? Uh, you wind the clock back to the early 1970s, there was a lot of concerns about water pollution. You have to remember Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, that more or less started the ecological movement, environmental movement, came out in 1963-64. The focus at that time was on mainly about pollutants. That was on persistent uh, uh, organic pollutants that were used as pesticides. And concern about the expanding housing. This is just a picture out in New Westminster where the shoreline just 100% developed and hardened and uh, you know natural habitat disappearing, expanding housing, golf courses, rail lines, just all the type of development that, that tends to go on in estuaries because they're so accessible by rail and by boat. And so by 1977 this sort of coalesced in a series of joint federal provincial studies to say uh, you know provincial and federal government look at the Fraser estuary and so there for two years, 77, 78, there's a Fraser River Estuary Study 1 to sort of look at the pollution impacts, what was going on to salmonid habitat. And that, like any good study, recommended another study. So there's a follow-up study in 1979-82 to sort of look at some of the recommendations and issues in the first one. And then there was a follow-up uh, study where this 1983-84 looked at the first two Fraser River Estuary Study 1 and 2, and this study in 1980 ended in 1984 and recommended that, that the way to look after the Fraser estuary because of the, the incredible complexity of it, as Jordan pointed out, it recommended the formation of a collaborative estuary and governance program. And this was very innovative for 1984. This was sort of cutting edge thinking. So in 1995, uh, Fremp uh, was signed and it was called the Fremp One and signed in late 1985. There's five signatories, DFO, Environment Canada, BC Environment, Port Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Port. Opened a secretariat office in New Westminster that was gonna be a contact point for the public. These are some of the, uh, of the members of that. And the budget at that time was 50,000 per year from each of the signatories. So with five signatories at 50K, it was around 250,000 a year is what was, what was used to pay to operate FREMP. FREMP 2 started from 91 to 94 and it had an increased budget and the difference is that GVRD, as it was called at the time, now Metro Vancouver joined and the budget went up to 600,000 a year from 250. And then it moved the office. And so there was a formal office that moved from New Westminster Waterfront to the office uh, out on Kingsway where it was uh, up until it closed. And at that time, it picked up another program, which was called BEEP, the Broad Inlet Environmental Action Program, which was similar but smaller scale to the Fraser River Estuary Management program and the two of them were consolidated and run out of the same office and that's why to this day for those of us that were around at the time often refer to it as beep Fremp because the two programs were housed in the same building with the same personnel and so what Fremp did is it had eight activity programs we're looking at water quality waste management port industrial development recreation etc so it had a pretty pretty uh pretty busy plate it produced annual reports each year and uh and the real guidepost of it is that when FREMP 2 finally got implemented, there was a couple of documents that have been worked on for a long time by people in DFO and Environment Canada and, and BC Minister of Environment. One was the coordinated project review process, uh, which had been established in 1986, but not really implemented. And the second one was the uh, area critical area designation, where the estuary was drawn off into red, yellow, and green zone designations where you could or could not build. And so in a red zone, you just couldn't put any industry in there under any circumstance. It was just considered environmentally too sensitive. Those are the two sort of uh, tools that, that FREMP 2 used. And then the sort of the philosophical document that FREMP worked under, it took a long time to get to this, but it was issued in 19, 1994. It's called the Living Working River. And this really was reflective of the sort of dichotomy that uh, half of FREMP was about looking after the environment and the protection of the ecosystem and the other half of it was all about the industrial activities that went on and to this day this tension between the two uh, was evident throughout the whole time that Fremp was in existence and, and it's even more so today. The purpose of Fremp, it was designed from those uh, early uh, estuary studies to be a collaborative intergovernmental governance program and it was supposed to coordinate 
all environmental management reviews, coordinate interagency communication between the five to six partners, and it would give issue project approvals and shoreline developments in the Fraser River estuary. That was its core purpose. The whole idea that prior to that, uh, developers, any work that was going to be done that that individual proponents would shop around and they go each of the, the five or six proponents individually. It took a long time. And the whole idea was to streamline it into this sort of one window review where, where they would just report to be prep, submit it, and then it would be circulated internally to the project partners. And the whole idea was to stop proponents from shopping around because traditionally what they do is they go and get approval from one of the uh, you know more compliant partners and then by the time they came to the, the least compliant, they'd say, well, everybody else has signed on, so sign here. And, and so FREMP was designed to circumvent that and stop it from happening. Um, FREMP would take all of the applications in on this one window shopping. They'd contact all the relevant agencies. This is the referral process. All the feedback was uh, sent back into one coordinated response. And so the lead agency would then re report back the proponent whether they could or could not go ahead with their with their project. And, uh, and if it required changes, they do so. And so it really streamlined it and actually got major project approval down to 80 days in some cases. I know you probably can't see this, but it's just to show you this is just uh, in the dying days of FRAMP, just the, the project list that were, were being looked at, an example of things like the White Rock Pier, making changes to the pier, uh, repair the Georgia Gulf of Georgia cannery out at Stevenson, things like that. And it said, what was the activity? What was the project type? Who was the lead agency status file date? And so there was a big file that sort of FRAMP was managing. And then it disappeared. And so people have been wondering why it disappeared. And it's pretty, pretty clear. Uh, conservative government got elected in 2006 and DFO and, FREMP, uh, DFO and Environment Canada staff stopped coming to the FREMP meetings. We'd be sitting around the meeting. I worked at Metro Vancouver at the time. And because I was a civil engineer and biologist, I was in all the committees on all the meetings. And we just noticed that we had these empty chairs that were just told DFO and Environment Canada would no longer be attending. And we kept wondering where they went. We were getting fat from eating all the donuts we'd bought because the, that was the, nobody showing up. And then in 2011, the Conservatives got a majority government. And then 2012, Bill C-38 came, came along, the famous Omnibus Bill, and uh, called the Jobs, Growth, and Long-Term Prosperity Act. And then March 31st, 2013, Fremp and people were terminated by the federal government quietly and they just said budget constraints. This essentially started the, the war on science by the Conservative government. And these are lots of protests over North Vancouver, where I live, outside the office of Andrew Saxton, who was the MP at the time, no longer is. And at that time, when Fremp disappeared, Port Metro Vancouver stepped in and replaced it. And if you go to the Port Metro Vancouver website today, this is what it says. They have a project environmental review process, and they, they fulfilled their federal responsibilities under two acts. And so that's basically the replacement for FREMP, that they, they, it's the port is running the whole show now. And it's under these two acts, the Canada Marine Act and the Impact Assessment Act. In my mind, four core reasons why FREMP disappeared. There was no legislated Fraser River Estuary Act to protect it from hostile governments like the Conservative government. There was no dedicated FREMP funding. So it was easy for a hostile government to essentially starve it of funding. There was no First Nations partnership or participation at all that I ever saw in the time I was involved in it. And there's no environmental organized uh, NGO government uh, or participation in it. And what this allowed the Harper government to quietly terminate FRAMP and BEEP via the budget restraint excuse. One only needs to look at the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that's persisted from the 1960s. It's a bilateral agreement between Canada and the US. It's persisted through all levels of government. Nobody can kill it because these things have all been addressed in advance so that it couldn't be terminated. Why we need FREMP? This is what the uh, Fraser looked like 13,500 years ago. There was not much of a Fraser estuary. The Fraser estuary started up around uh, New Westminster as the glaciers melted back. And then gradually all of this sediment from New Westminster was laid down here. And so we have the bedrock, the ice age, and all this deltaic sediments has been laid down in the last 12,500 years perfectly consistent with traditional ecological knowledge from First Nations in the area about how the estuary gradually built in as that sediment was laid down. And the first European mention of the estuary was in 1792 when uh, George Vancouver sailed around Point Grey. 
And his comment was that as they stopped just off UVC and tried to find the Fraser, they could see the brown water coming out, but they couldn't get into the river because there was essentially one giant log jam from essentially Sawasan all the way around to Point Grey. That's how much wood and logs and stumps had come down since time immemorial and were building up on the estuary front. That didn't last long because uh, navigation became a key thing with the uh, with the gold rush and the caribou and so steam powered snag and log removal and this was the start of the manipulation of the estuary and we look at it today with the Tawasan ferry terminal and YVR and the Iona North Arm jetty and the Iona deep outfall jetty Roberts Bank T1 T2 the ongoing dredging uh, it's just been a myriad of development and uh, the best way to summarize this, I couldn't do it as eloquently as Stephen Hume in his great book on In Search of Modern BC, the book on Simon Fraser. And this is what Stephen Hume said, that if Simon Fraser today would pause at the shoreline, water seeping into your shoes, concentrate on what remained of the view that greeted Simon Fraser 200 years earlier. So other than the panorama of sea and sky and mountains, everything else has changed. That's the extraordinary amount of development that's gone on in the estuary. You've got the training dike of the North Arm Dike, the Iona Jetty, the uh, Main Arm Training Dike, the, the uh, Roberts Bank, and the uh, Tawasan. This direct sediment out into the Gulf of Georgia and Salish Sea. This, this reduces sediment settling, which is starting to affect the health of the estuary here. And all of this has blocked juvenile salmon migration and, and impeded connectivity across the estuary front. This is a picture from my colleague, Dr. Rosenau, that showed that at each one of these cell mounted my, uh, juveniles are interrupted as they're spending uh, some variable amount of time from a few days up to a couple of months to adjust from fresh water to salt water, that they can no longer migrate and they have to swim around these things. And a recent paper has shown that this habitat connectivity problem is one of the major causes that's uh, attributed to the declining cell monads in the Fraser estuary. And we all know last year was one of the, is the worst on record for sockeye, you know, other issues going on. We know there's agriculture and ocean survival, big bar slide, but without an estuary, you can't have salmonids because salmonids have to go through an estuary, both as adults coming in and juveniles going out to make the osmoregulatory adjustment between fresh and salt water. So in conclusions, this is setting up for Dr. Martin to speak next, is that there was no collaborative estuarine governance program existing today. Less than 30% of the estuary habitat remains. The estuary is on the brink of collapse right now. I won't speak anymore because that's what Dr. Martin will be speaking of. Just FYI, uh, I have a book that's coming out and uh, it's being printed tomorrow. So this is a, a essay, set of essays by, by 12 very prominent people that have been working in the estuary for up to 45 years. That'll be out shortly. And I'm also making a feature documentary that will be available in June that focuses and it's entitled The Soul of the Fraser because that's what we call the estuary, the soul of the Fraser River. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you about this. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for those pictures. Uh, that's uh, still quite startling to see. So thank you for setting the stage too to you know where we are in our current situation. And I'm going to pass on now to Dr. Tara Martin, a professor in conservation science in the Faculty of Forestry at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Martin is also the Lieber Eero Chair in Conservation at UBC. She is a pioneer in the field of conservation decision science, combining predictive ecological modern models with decision science to inform what actions to take, where to take them, and when to achieve our conservation and natural resource management goals. Did I say when to achieve? Dr. Martin leads a team of graduate students and research fellows seeking to understand predict and ultimately inform decisions about the impact of global change on biodiversity and natural resources. Dr. Martin was recently awarded the, Na the Nature Conservancy Prof Professor in Practice Award, Thompson Reuters Citation and Innovation Award for her work in climate change decision making, and a, Wilderbor a Wilberforce Conservation Fellowship. Dr. Martin is a member of the IUCN Climate Change Specialist Group and co-leads the Climate Adaptation Theme. The floor is yours, Dr. Martin. Thanks, Benita, and thank you, Ken and Jordan, for setting the stage so beautifully. 
I'm just going to share my screen. I'll get started here. Okay. Great. Thank you for joining us today uh, in what is a really important conversation uh, for the future of the Fraser River estuary. I'm speaking with you today from the unceded territory of the Penelicate, Cowichan, and Wasanic Nations. I'm sitting here on Salt Spring Island, and I'm going to share with you some of the results of work that we've been doing in the Lower Fraser to understand the, the impacts of all of these cumulative pressures on the biodiversity within the system and to um, understand what we can do about it to save these um, precious biodiversity. So the Fraser, as, as, as we've just heard, it really is the life force of the Salish Sea. And it's one of the uh, most productive regions of our province. It's also been the home for uh, nations for millennia, and it's the home uh, of most British Columbians today. And it's also been a region that has supported livelihoods for millennia. And it's home to many species, uh, over 700 species uh, call this region their, their home, but 102 of those species are facing extinction, everything from southern resident killer whales, we have five species of salmon, uh, but more importantly, uh, we have over 50 genetically distinct populations of salmon within the Fraser. We have green and, and white sturgeon, pink fawn lilies, western sandpipers, many, many other species. As Ken has just walked us through, there's many threats on the system that have persisted for since colonization, you know, vast urban and industrial development, channel navigation and dredging, we have invasive species invasions, agricultural intensification, gravel mining, dead zones um, due to our flood infrastructure, fishing pressure, uh, sea level rise and temperature rise. We also have a whole bunch of stuff that's uh, literally in the pipeline. We have proposed jet fuel storage uh, facilities, proposed coal export terminal, LNG export terminal, uh, the proposed terminal two port expansion, Trans Mountain Pipeline. So there's stuff uh, that we're already dealing with, but but it, it's the, the future is looking a lot more um, stressful for biodiversity in the system if we continue business as usual. So we set out to, uh, uh, we asked the question, you know, how do we recover species uh, in this such an important region, but also in such a, a highly modified uh, region, which face, you know, facing these multiple threats. And this is not a question that's unique to the lower Fraser. This is a question that we're asking around the world and in many ecosystems that are facing multiple threats. Uh, and so as a response to that, my team developed a, a tool which we call priority threat management. And this is a decision making tool. Uh, this was a, a work that we first developed over 10 years ago now. And we've applied this process around the world. And essentially it sets out to prioritize the actions for species and ecosystem recovery by their cost effectiveness. So in other words, within a region, what are the most cost effective actions we can take that are going to save the most species for the least cost? And that least cost component is important because we have a lot of other things that we want to do with our resources. Conservation resources are almost always limited. It informs us of the most cost effective actions and where to do these actions. It calculates the cost of recovering all species within a region. And it calculates the how many species or even populations of species for, for, uh, for salmon, for example, we can recover for a given budget. The process is fast and it's inexpensive compared to recovery planning processes uh, undertaken under our Species at Risk Act, for example, it takes a fraction of the resources to do these assessments. 
So over the last uh, six years, we've actually undertaken uh, many of these assessments from the St. John watershed in New Brunswick right across to British Columbia. And I'm going to share results now from this assessment that we've uh, just completed in the lower Fraser estuary. So this process is what we call a structured decision making process that fo follows kind of these key steps. The first is about defining the problem. So who are the, uh, you know, what is the region? What are the boundaries of the region that we're dealing with? What are the species we're thinking about? Who are the key decision makers and landholders within the region? And what are the objectives? What are we trying to, to achieve? And in this case, it's, it's quite simple. We're trying to save the most species uh, for the least cost. In order to do that, we need to understand the threats. So all of those threats that, that Ken mentioned, we need to have a good understanding of what are those threats and how are they impacting um, those species that we care about. Based on that, we can then uh, develop management strategies to abate and mitigate those threats. And those management strategies are made up of a bunch of actions. And those actions have an economic cost. They have a benefit in terms of improving the recovery and the persistence of those species. And they have a feasibility. So they have a, a, a technical feasibility that they be implemented uh, successfully. And they have a socio-political feasibility that they would in, in terms of that they would be implemented at all. With those parameters, we can estimate the cost effectiveness. And then we can inform strategic investments, we can implement those actions, and we can monitor their effectiveness. So that's the process. So we published the results um, of this work uh, in a paper late last year called Conservation in Heavily Urbanized Biodiverse Regions Requires Urgent Management Action and Attention to Government Governance. And so here are some results now. So our problem, we're trying to recover these 102 species for the minimum cost, and we want to do this over a 25-year time frame. We've set that time frame because most of the species that we're uh, including in this analysis have at least a couple of generation times within that 25 years, except um, it, the southern residents, which, which would only have one, one generation time. Our objectives are to maximize the persistence of species. And so what persistence means here is not that we'll have a few salmon hanging around in the estuary in 25 years time. It means that we'll have self-sustaining populations of species that are meeting their ecological functions and their economic functions. It mean, we also want to minimize uh, the cost of those management actions, and we want to maximize the feasibility of those actions. So we then need to, to develop all of these strategies. So here's just a list of a few of the strategies that we developed for the Lower Fraser. Things like managing invasive problematic species. We have a strategy around aquatic habitat restoration. We have strategy around pollution control, another one around aquatic disease control, transport regulation, fisheries management, and so on. And so each of these overarching strategies is made up of very specific actions. And it's those actions that get costed um, and we estimate the benefit and feasibility of. So this, uh, this equation, this is a cost effectiveness equation. It's very similar to a cost benefit analysis. So here we have cost effectiveness, CE, uh, equals the, the benefit of an action uh, by the feasibility of the action divided by the cost of the action. And then we, in order to, to estimate the overall benefit of a particular strategy, we sum up the benefit for all of our species across that strategy. And so it, it works a bit like this. First, we estimate what is the, the probability of our salmon, our sockeye salmon, 
uh, going to be thriving and self-sustaining in 25 years if we do nothing. So we have a, a probability um, under our current uh, status quo state. And then we estimate that probability given we implement a particular action. And it's the difference between taking an action and, and doing nothing that difference is the benefit of that particular strategy. So we go through that process uh, for all of our species and all of our strategies. So how do we get these parameters? If we, we in, in my lab, we, have a, we spend a lot of time in the field and we collect a lot of data. However, in order to get those, those parameters in a timely way to undertake these analyses, it would take us decades to undertake that research. And so in order to, to augment the, the data that we have from field studies and published scientific uh, analyses, uh, we convene groups of experts. So here's a group of experts in the salmon ecology and management of the Lower Fraser. Uh, we convened these folks just before the COVID lockdown. And we locked them in a room for a week and we ask them to estimate these parameters for us. And when they, they provide these, these estimates, they, they don't provide us a, a single estimate, they provide their kind of best guess, their worst case scenario, their best case scenario. So we capture their uncertainty uh, around these estimates. And that's really important because of course, you know, models are wrong, but also expert judgment can be wrong. And what we wanna know is, is how, how does that uncertainty around their estimates ultimately influence the priorities and the things that we would do? So in terms of the outcomes, let's, let's walk through these figures. So on the bottom here, we have our 102 species grouped into functional groups. So we have a group from marine mammals through to land birds, and they've been grouped into these groups based on the expectation that the benefit of a strategy will be the same across all of the species within that group. And that just makes our analysis much easier than having to elicit uh, specific values for all of those 102 species. Now we can elicit values for these groups as a whole. Along the y-axis, we have this probability of persistence. So this is the probability that each of these groups is going to be self-sustaining and thriving and make, uh, meeting its ecological function in 25 years time. The blue bars, what we have here, this is where we are right now. This is the status quo or our baseline. And what this is saying is that only five of our groups exceed a 50% probability of persistence in 25 years time if we continue business as usual. So this is, this is grim. This is not where we wanna be. It means that all of these other groups are gonna have a less than 50% probability of persistence. So that's very sobering. It's sobering, but not surprising when you think about all of the, all of the, the changes that this estuary has undergone. So then if we implement our management strategies that we've identified, these priority strategies, what happens? We see that the probability of persistence for all of our species groups improves. And now e even our, our most uh, imperiled Southern resident killer whales, even they have a greater than 50% probability of persistence. And so this is incredibly hopeful. The probabilities are still low. We, we have uh, all groups are over 50% and eight groups are, are over 60% probability of persistence. But we're still missing a really key component, which brings us to the conversation we're having today, which is around governance. You know, can we do better? We're, we're the, these, the, the situation in which we are, are operating in right now is one where there's essentially a governance vacuum. And as Ken said, you know, the, the Port of Vancouver has, has taken on the de facto role of, of, of a governing body uh, for the estuary. For species and ecosystems persistence, that is very problematic. And so we went back to our experts. We, we 
convened a, a, a group of experts um, who had experience with FRAMP, um, who had, had experienced uh, what it, the, the benefits and, say, and the perils of, of the previous uh, 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 Fraser River Estuary Management Program. And we sat down and we talked about, you know, if we were to revamp something like FRAMP, how could we make it better? You know, what would be a governance uh, body uh, framework that would help to implement these management strategies and, um, and ultimately improve their feasibility? Because that would be that that was how they would influence they would influence uh, the the probability of persistence of these species by improving that that f that feasibility, and and what we came up with was the development of a Fraser River Estuary Act. So it, it, as as Dr. Ashley said, this was a a, a an act that was legally binding. Um, it uh, First Nation it participation was front and center. It brought together nations. It brought together the, the feds and the province and the municipalities together. Um, it has it, it also it coordinated with with the NGOs and it had a dedicated funding source. And so once we had uh, kind of articulated what that uh, governance body looked like, we went back to our, est our experts and we asked them to re-estimate the feasibility um, of these management strategies. And across all of the strategies, we found that the feasibility increased and that in turn increased the predictions of the probability of persistence for our strategies by at least between five and 15%. And so now with management and co-governance governance, we have at least 10 groups that achieve that greater than 60% probability of persistence. Simultaneously, uh, I, I myself and, and were, uh, folks from my team um, worked with the Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance, uh, Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, and West Coast Environmental Law to really think about what does what are what does ecological governance mean, and um, could we develop some high level principles that would underpin something like a Fraser River Estuary Act, and and that process um, saw the development of five key principles, and the first and these really um, echo what Jordan um, spoke to in the beginning, and this is a commitment to sustainability that spans seven generations. Governance that honors Aboriginal rights and title, inherent Indigenous jurisdiction and law, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Clear enforcement mechanisms to ensure ecological resilience, sustainable funding for, governan for governance and ecosystem-based management, and respect for the opinion, voices, experiences, and cultures of others. So just to wrap up, this assessment shows that if we continue business as usual, we're here in the red. We 38% of those 102 species have a greater than 50% probability of persistence. But if we invest in those management strategies and co-governance, all of these species have a greater than 50% chance of persistence and, and 10 of those groups of species have a greater than 60% chance of persistence. What's the price tag? The present value is around $381 million over 25 years. And that might seem like a big sum of money, uh, but the annual estimated value is, is only around 15 million a year. And that's the equivalent of around one beer or one coffee per person per year in the lower mainland it's not actually a huge investment. And when you look at what are some of the other things that we might get from this type of investment? So what are the, the co-benefits of investing in species conservation in the Lower Fraser? Well, we could save uh, uh, our salmon fishery and that's worth around 300 million a year. 
Uh, we could save a whale watching industry worth around 26 million a year. Uh, we can create over 50 full-time jobs by implementing those management strategies. That's around 4 million a year. Uh, and that's about the same number of jobs that will be created with the Trans Mountain Pipeline uh, in, in, in our region. So this is around 30, $330 million versus 50 million annually. You know, it's it's really th this type of analysis is really important to start showing that often the co benefits of these investments far outweigh the cost. So I'll just end back on this slide. We have 102 species at risk of extinction, but it's not too late to save them. In fact, if we all just raised our our glass to the Fraser, you know, we could we could save these species. So thank you. Well, thank you and uh, thank you very much for um, giving some facts and figures there and to, to show some balance on the uh, preservation um, and the urbanization and the development and the economical activity. Thank you very much for that. So this is the point in the presentation where we go ahead and open up the question and answer box and I know there's a few but I'm I'm going to start with um, asking uh, Dr. Ashley on this one because this is one of the uh, eye-opening points that I didn't realize was the management by the port right now so there was a question in the box is can you just confirm that that uh, the the port what pieces the port is doing in that uh, decision making process for development and uh, I, when it when it was taken away from uh, government jurisdiction again, if you could just reiterate. Yeah, it was on the uh, the day after on March thirty first, two thousand thirteen, when when uh, Beep and Fremp were terminated. Then the next day, the port sort of stepped in, and so then they just management under the acts that the port is is uh, is responsible for. So it's uh, basically the fox is guarding the chicken coop now because you know the port's business is very different from what dfo's mandate was or environment canada and so it's very problematic as tara said to have the port essentially the sole sort of a uh, higher level governance body looking after the fraser estuary and do they take input right now from uh, ngos or even from metro vancouver do you know how that uh, um, not that I'm aware of the uh, the review process is very, is is pretty uh, is pretty closed shop. It, it's basically pro, pro development. Okay, thank you. My next uh, question is, and, and thank you for Councillor Dupont for that one. And my next question is for Director uh, Point, and this one is from Patrick Johnstone. Um, this one is about uh, his question here is that he is wondering. He sees the 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 need for the First Nation lead on this work and to bring that knowledge to the table. And he's wondering if you can share what the capacity and mandate should be in 2021. Who has the capacity and mandate in 2021 to bring people together towards what I think we all agree would be a beneficial cooperation. Do you have any? Um... Well, I, as I indicated earlier, um in the last year and a half there's been numerous scales of government that are looking for a strategic uh direction in terms of like responding to the current dynamic that we're in uh there's a federal uh, pacific salmon strategic initiative uh, mandate that was uh, recently issued by the minister of fisheries and oceans um we have parliamentary secretary uh donnelly with a uh, a mandate letter that uh, talks about revitalizing and rebuilding populations. First Nations Leadership Council is, is looking for a strategic uh, plan to move forward. So I think it's really uh, the perfect storm for us to really start moving the conversation forward. And I don't know if one particular uh, body needs to hold the mandate. I think it's really identifying the linkages and then trying to identify ways to support uh, this kind of co-governance model. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I also too, the, the comments that you made earlier about the fact there's a lot of conversations going on, or there have been a lot of conversations going on for a, a long time. And maybe this is a, a time based on just how much conversations have come together to explore that even further, the best way to move forward. Okay, my next one is going to be for Dr. Martin. And first of all, Dr. Martin, there's a, a request if, if 
if I, some of those graphs could go out on social media to make the probability points. Um, so that's, that's, I see you nod in your head there, but I just yep. want to um, go to the one that David Grigg has here um, about an act. So how would an act be enforced and who would manage any resulting bylaws and does Metro Vancouver have that power? Yeah, these, the, these, are, these are questions in a level of detail that I'm, I'm not the best person to answer, uh, but I think the, the reason why uh, it was framed as uh, it, that an act was seen as needed was because of those failings of FRAMP, that if there, if there was, if something didn't have legislative clout, then it could be easily terminated. Um, and, uh, and also it needed to have, you know, a consistent stream of funding, uh, as well as uh, diverse participation. So in, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the fine details, uh, you know, none of that has been really delved into yet, but that is something that we're starting to explore, you know, actually, how would we develop such a such a process, but there, there are some very good examples elsewhere to, to draw from. Okay, and that's one of our questions that's going to be coming up and I'm going to ask all of the panelists, um, the, the, the question from James Casey, but before that, um, Dr. Martin, I'm just going to stay with you and ask you from John Manuel is asking, uh, I'm curious that your list of alternate strategies does not include land use controls, which is kind of similar to the question that we just had, which would seem relevant to some of the species involved. So did you want to expand on any more on the land use? Sure. Control? What I showed you was just a small subset of a much longer list of strategies. So rather than putting all of the strategies up, so um, uh, what, I'll, what we can do is we can circulate the, the, the journal publication and the supplementary material to that, which kind of includes all of the strategies and the details below them. But yes, we have a, we have a strategy around public land management and also one around uh, private land management, um, which, which touches on, on, on what you're, you're referring to. Right. Great. Okay, I'm going to go back to Dr. Ashley then, and this is on the James Casey. So uh, James says the Fraser, the Fraser Estuary has been identified internationally as a key biodiversity area. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature has a guidance document for business operating in KBAs. I was wondering if any of the panel members have come across businesses and investors applying these or other similar guidelines when operating in the Fraser Estuary? So I guess this is just a, an experience question if you've got some uh, uh, short answer. Here. Short answer, no. And I think uh, the, the, the problem is either the federal provincial government uh, doesn't really recognize some of those international uh, designations because it falls, they're not prepared to give up their, their jurisdictional legislation, whether Environment Canada or DFO on it. So uh, you get, uh, you get sort of statements made, you know, external to Canada or BC, but they're not really adhered to too much. Mm. All right, and then I'll ask uh, Director Point or uh, Dr. Martin if you'd like to add any anything. Similar short answer, no, I have not come across it. All right, so I am going to move on to Ross Dixon. And Ross, you had a question about Metro Vancouver's um, input. So Metro Vancouver is now considering a FREMP beep 2.0 or something similar. What do the panelists, and I guess maybe I'll push this one to um, Dr. Martin and because uh, you were talking about the, the uh, governance model. What do the panelists think of the necessary scope for regional ecological governance and why not for the entire Fraser watershed? Yeah, it's a, a great question, Ross. The, I mean, the entire, the entire watershed is enormous. It takes up, a, it's a, a large part of British Columbia and it's incredibly complex in terms of its, uh, the various governance um, bodies that would be involved. The reason why we focused on the lower Fraser was uh, because of its incredibly high biodiversity and, and also because of salmon, you know, all, all of those 53 conservation units of salmon in the Fraser have to pass through the lower Fraser. If the lower Fraser estuary isn't in doing well, then none of those salmon stocks are going to be doing well. And, and so that's, that's our starting point really is thinking about that, that, uh, 
that lower region. Uh, but I, I mean, it, it is worth, there's been some very interesting um, recent developments in terms of, you know, rights to rivers. And we have an example of that in Canada now and, and uh, examples in New Zealand and in Ecuador where, we're, where you know, these entities are being um, given uh, rights. Uh, so there's are, there are other models, uh, but I, I think that uh, the, in terms of the uh, jurisdiction or in terms of the, 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 the region, the, the lower Fraser captures um, many more uh, a, a lot more complexity than those than those other regions. Uh, it's not to say that they can't be included, but I think that we need to start. Uh, we need to start here. Maybe I could just comment on that, uh, Benita. I've been fortunate enough in the last uh, forty years to work in all parts of the Fraser, and and I think that uh, you know maybe maybe 30, 40 years down the line there might be an overall Fraser River management, but. The drivers that are in the middle and upper Fraser are so different than the Estuarine drivers that to try and reconcile them all at one time, uh, I think it would just be too complex. You know, like the upper Fraser and Nechaco, I mean, the Kenny Dam and the lack of releases out of the Kenny Dam is the main driver on the Nechaco. The middle Fraser, it's agriculture, it's pine beetle kill, the changes in hydrology and snowpack runoff, big bar, you know, no, no, no sort of connection to sort of ocean shipping and Roberts Bank and coal export, things like that. So I think ideally you'd end up with a, an upper Fraser, middle, lower Fraser and estuary. And then, and then those four groups once up and running would then form together in a super group and that would take some time. But if you try to do it all at once, I think it would uh, diminish, uh, diminish its probability of having. You're on mute, Benita. Thank you. I'm going to take a couple more questions here. And actually, I have just have one from Anna Matheson. She, uh, she just made a comment here that uh, it's important to highlight that the valuable functions of the, the BEEP and the FRAMP, um, that it was coordinating policy and planning between all program partners, as well as municipalities along the estuary and the inlet, that this made it an incredible, valuable place for discussions of upland linkages. Thank you for that. So I'm going to have these two last questions here, one from David Gregg and one from Michael Weeb. This first one is for Director Point. The co-governance model you have referred to is a very positive way to get First Nations involved. How does this working without most lower Fraser First Nations not at the Metro Vancouver table? And um, I, I think that's a difficult one. Uh, well, I think yeah, I, I understand the intent of the question and it's it's a it's a it's a challenge we have. Uh, it's a chronic challenge we have uh, working with um, so many nations across the province. Uh, people want their voice at the table, and uh, and uh, it's a challenge to make sure. There's obviously at any table there's not 200 seats for 200 nations to sit at the table. And even referring back to the other question about why couldn't we do the scope and scale for the whole Fraser uh, watershed? It's 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 the complexity. It's uh, understanding um, how complex different governing structures are between and among the nations. Even the nations themselves have um, different governing structures that uh, are um, more aggregate and span from uh, provincial scale to watershed scale, to local scale, to a tribal council scale, to an independent scale. Uh, and each one of them has their, their different scale of authority. So um, nonetheless, the nations recognize that they're stronger uh, when they work together and they're able to develop a coherent message to advance their interests. And so that's what most of the nations are committed to is saying, how do we share matters of broad concern that affect all of us? And how do we put that into coherent messaging back to uh, different um, processes? Uh, so I think, um, with regards to Port Metro's table, we are in conversations with Port Metro about uh, developing uh, structures and developing kind of like a, an indigenous advisory group that can help inform people that may be sitting at the table. So, um, so we're, we're, we're open to that conversation. Um, we don't wanna to be too prescriptive. It's not our place to prescribe uh, the nation's interests, uh, but we, we like to, um, Keep an open door there so that uh, First Nations can bring their 
perspectives to the table. Thank you for that. All right, so the one last question, and Ken, it's gonna come, it's gonna start with you, but I wonder if you don't mind with this question to have a bit of a wrap up, if you, there was one or something that you wanted to wrap up or say at the end, and then I'll, I'll move to um, Dr. Martin to ask if there's anything she wants to wrap up uh, to say, and then I'll finish with Director um, Point if there's anything he'd like to say before I just go into my closing statements. So the question, Ken, from Michael Weeb is, um, you talked about the environmental NGOs and the First Nations not being involved as part of the failure of the past uh, FREMP. And how do you see the nations and the NGOs and academia playing a role in a newly envisioned management or FREMP beep type of a process? Well, I think, uh, you know, as I said earlier, Fremp and Beep for their day were considered pretty, uh, pretty cutting edge. But that's, you know, just like the 1997 Ford Explorer in my driveway. I go out and look at it now and cringe that, uh, you know, it looks pretty archaic by today's standards. And had Fremp and Beep been around, I think they would have evolved to the point where it would have had a full undrip makeover and an NGO makeover. And it would have been doing the good things it was doing, but better because it would have had First Nations and... Uh, and uh, NGO involvement. That's the kind of the, uh, the evolutionary model. The revolutionary model was just to have it right from the get-go, a new act that enshrines into the act, uh, First Nations and, and NGO. So, so either, either way it could work. It's just that it needed to be modernized and, and the core thing that was missing was, was First Nations. But you know, in the 1970s, uh, First Nations had done much saying anything, nor did NGO. So it's not surprising that it, it looks outdated looking back on it, but that's not to say that if Fremp was around today, that it couldn't be, uh, it couldn't be modernized. And that's why I call it the Fremp 3.0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Did you have anything you'd like to share on closing? Yeah, I just like to go back to you know the urgency that we're we're at a, at a point where we we can't talk about this for ten years. We really need to take action soon. You know these these species um, are going to wink out and in terms of their kind of viability and their ability to, to meet their ecological functions and, and also their economic functions um, and their cultural functions if we don't act soon. So I think that's, a, that's, a, that's really the, the key the key here is that we, we need to get on it and that the price tag isn't that much. 46 million of that 381 million, 46 million of that is for the development of, a, of an act, of a Fraser River Estuary Act, if that's the direction that we wanted to get head in. Um, that's not a lot of money when you break it down um, per person in the lower mainland. Still on mute, thank you very much. And Director Point, did you want to close it, close it out? Yeah, maybe some final comments. I really appreciate the uh, um, presentations of uh, Ken and Tara. It was really um, informative to me. I think that, uh, you know, walking away from the table, I, um, I just answered a question there about uh, decision-making with First Nations and how do we, how do we get there? And, um, we tend to... Uh, as I, as I alluded earlier about uh, our, our notion and our concept, our worldview about getting to a good place in a good way is trying to find enabling language that isn't prescriptive in, um, I, I remember talking to some scientists once and they were looking for my opinion. And I said, you know, that's not my place to offer my opinion because in a seven generations model, I have to consider those that came before me. I have to think about those, that, um, my children, my grandchildren, those out in front. And I can't answer for myself. I have to think about something that is broader than that. So it's really about using enabling language to say, we're here to advance the interests. We agree on uh, um, specific kind of um, themes. And then how do we move that conversation forward in a good way? as opposed to getting into opinions and decisions and, and that. It's the way for us to, to um, move the conversation forward, especially when we're working in different scopes of governance and authorities and jurisdiction. So um, I, I would leave the, the group with that notion that uh, um, the notion of uh, Natsumat is uh, about uh, one heart and one mind. And um, it's really about we all know that as, as people, 
it's kind of elusive really to be of one heart and one mind. But if we're, we're thinking of a good thing, I like this co-governance of the, for the best interest of the ecosystem and these species, I think we can be of one heart and one mind, that would be a good thing. So thank you. Thank you very much. And that's a great, a great way to leave it. And um, when this group, just for the, those that are um, dialing in today and watching it, when we started envisioning what this conversation might look like, uh, the vision that we kind of put down on paper was a resilient Fraser River estuary where salmon, people, and econ economies flourish. Um, we want it open to, 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 to that coming together. Um, based on all of these conversations that are happening. So I will just close by saying uh, thank you so much for an amazing afternoon. And um, as I was saying, we, we were putting together this, this conversation and, and the goal was really around um, educating and, and, and bringing all those points of view together in one space. Um, but we didn't wanna just leave it there. We did want there to be some action to, 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 to Dr. Martin's point about the urgency of the situation. So um, in, in the spirit of this renewed um, planning function with a co-governance approach, we've put together a, a motion, a template of a motion, which we can uh, send out post this conversation to all the registrants that can be taken to local councils or to be used to speak to your local governments, your uh, all levels of government that you in your community, because really to get some budget set aside might be a, a, a thing that could be helpful. So I just wanted to let everyone know that post this uh, event, there will be a template that will go out to everyone. Um, I'm gonna close out by just saying what, an, what a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all for sharing your knowledge, your research, your wisdom. Thank you for Climate Caucus for putting this on. Climate Caucus um, is a group of elected officials, but I think we had even a wider audience today. And if anybody does have uh, questions to follow up, they can certainly reach out to Alex through the Climate Caucus. All right, I think I'm not sure what our timing is, 2.52. Amazing. Well, thank you very much. And do, uh, do uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Martin, to, to, do go out and tweet some of those graphs, if you don't mind, and we'll get it spread around. All right. Have a wonderful week. And thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody.